welcome to Cancer in Peace. My name is Sean Stewart, and I'm here with our 19-year cancer veteran host, Peter Scalzo. Welcome. Hey, Sean. Welcome, so, everyone. Yeah, today we're going to talk about, uh, we're, we're going in a, a different direction, topic that we haven't covered before, I think. Yeah. And so the, the general theme is something that we would call avoiding the elephant in the room. <laughs> and so we're going to get into that a little bit. And so... Peter has been practicing uh, in this area quite a bit of trying to avoid avoiding the elephant. Yeah, room. yeah I, I, <laughs> he, this morning he decided to make that. a change. He, <laughs> he made it clear that I'm uh, that I need to reintroduce myself, also known as the jerk. <laughs> <laughs> That's what friends are for. <laughs> because you made it quite clear that I was a jerk to you on a previous podcast, and so now I have to go back and look at it. I might have to do review inventory. I forgive you. And it was for part of the forgiveness. Amends, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm until I do that, I'm going to just put AKA the jerk <laughs> as my. No, no, my don't handle. do that. Okay. Don't do that. So we do want to talk about the, this elephant and not, yeah. a, not avoiding the elephant in the room. Yeah. And it's just such a big topic for, and I'm going to call it for emotional health and for yeah. somebody who's looking for a journey of peace. Uh, it's key not to do this. And, and I see this in organizational areas. We were talking about examples of seeing it in, church services, mm -hmm. which was kind of interesting, family relationships, mm -hmm. and I think the cancer journey itself, uh, we talked about some examples of that. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it might be good just to define it a little bit, talk about some examples of it, but how do we even approach um, the elephant in the room? What, if, what do we do? And uh, there's a, a couple of tools that I know from Pete Scazzaro's work that I think is, that we'll put on the table before the podcast out to to talk about it do you but, want to put them out there now or no later yeah so um well let's talk about the what it is first yeah, a little bit okay. and it's, yeah um because we were thinking about you know sometimes we use lingo and i'm pretty sure most people know what this means but you know when there is something that everybody in the in the room knows about that it's it's really big it's it's going to affect the way um, people think and act mm -hmm. but nobody's willing to talk about it mm-hmm and so that's the elephant in the room is then mm -hmm. we tend to have in some kind of human nature, we tend to avoid those things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, we're wrong about um, what we think the elephant in the room is too, or what's really going on behind the elephant in the room. And so it's good to talk about that. One of the things that I think that one of the most basic examples that I'll, I'll see if you would agree with that would be somebody who gets a cancer diagnosis that's serious and they basically deny that there's anything wrong and just keep right on going. Is that a fair? Yeah. And I think it could take a couple like forms of that steps of that, for instance, and I, the, I'm talking about people of faith really for, yeah. right now for this part of the conversation, because that's who I mostly dealt with. But the person of faith who says, you know, let's not discuss this cancer. Don't even mention it because it gives it reality. Jesus is taking care of it. We don't even have to talk about it. It isn't really there. He's already fixed it. Like that's an ultimate kind of denial. But yeah. I was also thinking about um, other forms, like I've dealt with people who have said, um, listen, whatever treatment you do, that's your decision. But um, folks that have said, you know what? Uh, traditional medicine, surgery can resolve this issue but I'm going to do it through supplements only kind of thing. And sort of denying that there is a fix that's out there that's proven, that's 100% proven, but, you know, you're going to go ahead and take vitamins and supplements. And in fact, in two cases for fairly easy cancer, both people passed. And by the time they, the elephant had sat on them, yeah. Right. The, it was too late, you know, to go down to the major cancer center yeah. kind of thing. The other thing that I'm just going to mention is um, a buddy of mine whose uh, 16 year old son had cancer and he was part of a faith community that said, God's got this. Don't we don't care what the doctors are saying. Don't worry about it. God's going to heal him. And in fact, his son passing and my buddy leaving the faith for at least two to three years to recover from what had happened. Yeah. I have experiences, I think in all of those arenas yeah. that you're sharing. 
Um, I think what we want to try to talk about today is the biggest underlier, the biggest thing that is causing the <clears throat> the elephant in the room to not be talked about, and that's fear. Yeah, because fear is what drives us to not talk about that, which is um, big and scary, and will affect everything about what's happening with everybody that's involved with whatever's happening there. And a cancer journey has potential. I mean, uh, cancer is one of the things that is feared in culture, society, in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, you and I have talked about so many situations that somebody, even the idea that they may have cancer and, and mm -hmm. they're done for that week while they're waiting for results or whatever is, uh, right. the, that, you know, fear just uh, grips them. And you've seen that, mm -hmm. you know, you and I have talked about several situations and, and then, you know, sometimes I mean, it turns out not to be in, and they're like, oh, I was just uh, in such a, a panic because of fear. I remember, you know, the faith community that I was in when I was first diagnosed in 2005 with high-grade cancer and being ashamed of my fear. So I didn't mention it. How are you doing, Peter? Great. Everything's going to be fine. I'm going to get surgery. Everything will be taken care of and stuffing it and not dealing with fear, thinking I'm not supposed to feel fear. I mean, that was a big yes. issue for me. Yes, I think that's good. It's, uh, the fact that there is a such a high mortality risk, mm -hmm. you know, a risk to your, your life shouldn't be voided. Right. That's, a, right. that's an elephant. It's like, hey, no, this is that serious. Right. And we right. actually do need to talk about that. And it does... Mm -hmm affect uh, future stability, finances, family life, um, your work, all these things are affected. And to not talk about it, to just avoid that is avoiding an elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And so for a cancer patient, somebody who's diagnosed who this is going to, you know, they're going through a major journey, um, this stuff should be talked about and, mm -hmm. and worked through, I think, mm -hmm. at this, at this, the big point, I think, right. of today. Right. And right. Uh, we were talking about a lot of different things that uh, we're seeing in culture around us and culture is telling us to fear what other people think, fear their response, even when we know what's good and right. Mm -hmm. um, we avoid, mm -hmm. which is what um, not, not addressing the elephant in the room is. It's a form of avoidance. Mm. And so there's a bit of an avoidance culture that I think is happening around us in Western culture, especially that uh, doesn't want to look at those hard things to look at pain mm -hmm. and, and walk through that. Does that resonate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we were, we were kicking around some, some ideas here. And so now that we kind of have that mm -hmm. a little bit of definition there, um, there's a couple of things that, that fit into this that are worth talking about that, um, you had had some conversations uh, recently and, and, uh, we were talking about, the way you addressed um, some hard situations and it was, there were unmet expectations. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and so one of the, the skills that uh, Scazzaro teaches is this um, clarifying expectations. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the things that we do is we have expectations of people, but we don't state them and we don't, mm -hmm. um, we don't get clarity on where they're at. And it's because mm -hmm. we're avoiding elephants. Um, but one of the best things we can do to bring peace and understanding is to take time to have stated expectations and ask for agreement mm -hmm. because expectations are only valid if they're stated and agreed upon. And so there's right. the skill of taking time to clarify expectations and uh, get agreement on what uh, the expectations really are between two people. Otherwise they're not real at all. And so we're talking about situations uh, and that could be as much as, treatments you know mm -hmm. uh, people could come into a cancer journey with a one person has expectation about how treatments are going to go and the other person you know a spouse may be no i don't that's not where they're at but if you don't have clarity on that then yeah i mean i was i ministered to a couple where she uh had advanced ovarian cancer and uh, she was choosing not to seek treatment uh, meanwhile, the husband and the rest of the family absolutely wanted her to seek treatment. And um, they f they had this big conflict, but no one was like talking about the elephant in the room, which was, you're expecting me to get treatment. I'm expecting not to 
receive treatment. So we need to talk about this and form an agreement on what, you know, at least have both parties say, this is what I'll agree to. And so she ended up agreeing to getting treatment, but, uh, it, it, and so they had peace after, even though it was hard and she, it was, and she passed, mm -hmm. but at least they had peace with that issue uh, with it. So very helpful. Yeah. So I want to put some, uh, I think there's some obvious there with the, the cancer treatments and patients, but mm -hmm. let's, let's make this relationships for a little while, because I think this is where, uh -oh. I think it's where it gets important <laughs> yeah. in, uh, in peace and the journey, because as cancer patients, you know, you're going through, you have relationships and you want to have peace in this journey. You want to have great family relationships. You want to be building towards unity and, deep connection and have a loving environment uh, as you're going on that process. And there could be a tendency, and I've seen this a lot, is to avoid conflict. And that's not what we're asking for. We're actually saying the opposite it is conflict. You said to me this morning, cause you were in your own situation. It's like conflict is good because we're going to get to the bottom of this and, and everybody's going to know where things stand and things are going to be addressed. And I think unaddressed conflicts are not peace. That's something brewing beneath the surface. And so I feel that tension as an organizational leader. When I know there's unaddressed conflict, I don't have to, or I, I know that it's unresolved because my body tells me it's unresolved. Mm -hmm. When there's unaddressed conflict, I can feel it inside of myself. Right. And so there's no peace when I can feel right. that conflicts that are unaddressed, that are just boiling, boiling, boiling. And I was thinking back about my time here in leadership and when I didn't address conflicts that I knew were real, um, that parties were willing to engage in avoidance, they always blew up bigger mm. in the long room than if I had just um, taken the time to address and get the parties together. And so I'm mm -hmm. thinking of several in my mind right now and <laughs> just going, oh my goodness, this were so painful. Um, and I think it can be as simple as um, somebody not making a payment on time. Mm -hmm. And when that wasn't addressed quickly, it turned into something bigger and bigger. And then it blew up to such a point that, oh, there's a problem here. And if this would have been addressed on day one, I wouldn't be sitting here with this really nasty situation that it's turned into. And so avoiding the elephant in the room of, hey, there's something that should have been dealt with that we've agreed upon that um, for some reason has fallen through the cracks and I avoided it. Man, mm -hmm. that blew up on me. Mm -hmm. So uh, you relate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. And with personal relationships with that, my issue is as a codependent guy, a guy who struggles with that is not is struggling to be direct and honest because of my people pleasing tendencies. So that's something I've really worked hard on is to really assess, okay, Peter, what is important to you in this? What's a principle here that you want to hold on to? And are you willing to be direct and honest with the other person? And um, I'm better at it and better at boundaries and things like that. But I think that uh, I still need work and being like, there's so many times I live for the expectations of others that I don't even ask myself, what are you really seeking in this? So I'm working on saying, okay, Peter, what are you seeking in this? And can you be direct and honest about that? Yeah. And this gets to um, this other tool that uh, mm -hmm. Scazzaro had put out and it's, um, he calls it climb the ladder of integrity. Mm. And I, I like this tool and I don't have the ladder in front of me, but, um, it starts out with, uh, what is my need? And it gets to the end of, I need to communicate what, and, and my, I think my communication will benefit this situation by, and so it, it's a point of getting from, I recognize there's something going on inside. There's an elephant. Mm -hmm. There's something that needs to be addressed and I don't want to avoid I start working through what it is that I need to say about uh, the situation and, and deal with and getting up to what are my values. I value in the situation and I dishonor that value when uh, to what I need from this is from you. 
mm-hmm. and having a communication on it. Yeah. And then having hopeful that, hey, by addressing it, that we can benefit by having this interaction. Yeah. And it's such a great um, tool to work up that ladder mm-hmm. from recognizing a need to let's have an honest communication about and after I've examined myself. So the first thing is examining myself. That to me is one of the most helpful steps is just for me to stop and say, okay, what is a principle that I'm trying to uphold here for myself? What is important to me with this, you know, and not living for the expectations of others. It fits into our conversation is that, Hey, you and you and I were talking about, it feels like in church life, yeah. um, we see a lot of compromises and uh, not for purposes of becoming legalistic, but giving a message to appease culture. Yeah. People pleasing, people pleasing. And, yeah. and it's, and I'm going to call it culture appeasing now. too. Yeah. So we're fr- so afraid to tell the truth right. about um, different aspects of the Christian journey that um, we're going to miss what is really the best about mm-hmm. this journey. Mm-hmm. And so, and that's not meant to be legalistic. It's really meant to get to the heart of, hey, can we communicate truth about the elephant in the room mm-hmm. and and work from that place of honoring that which we know to be true as opposed to fear, like you're saying, the people pleasing, fear of what others might say or do about what we're what we have to say. And so uh-huh. and I think that's where we're at in a cultural moment today. Um, yeah. And and as it relates back to the cancer journey it's really taking time to, to recognize, Hey, what are those relationships in your life where you've avoided some hard interactions or right. some interactions where truth hasn't been spoken? People are dancing around with each other because to get to peace, um, addressing those and working through the difficulty of that is one of the great, you know, the great wall mm-hmm. journeys that bring healing uh, mm-hmm. uh, of the journey, I think. And so, both of us have experienced. Yeah, I think so. I think that, um, especially in the cancer journey, when it comes to diagnoses or treatments or dealing with loved ones, whoever it may be, to avoid the elephant in the room, to sort of stuff it or just not want to deal with it. Um, it's, um, it's still, like you said, I think you mentioned before that you could tell in your body that there, that the elephant wasn't being dealt with. So there's something inside of us in our soul or whatever that, that is uneasy because the elephant hasn't been dealt with. But, and when we finally deal with the elephant and we process it and we discuss it, whatever we need to do, pray about it, however we handle it, then there's a lot of peace that comes from that. At least I can talk about my own life, you know, with that. And I remember in my 14th surgery, my sea change, uh, about 10 years after my initial di- diagnosis, when I finally recognized that I couldn't control the tough emotions anymore. I couldn't stuff them anymore. And I had to just bring out the elephant in the room, which is I struggle with fear. I struggle with sad sadness. I struggle with anger. I'm struggling with, um, with everything involved, anxiety, all this stuff going on. Uh, and, and the reality of death that I am facing death and dealt with it, voiced it out, recognize it, let it come out, dealt with it. I had a lot more peace moving forward, you know? Yeah. And my example is not from a cancer in this case, but I'd like to just, um, I remember, um, there was a really hard item, uh, with my in-laws that, um, needed to be talked about and, uh, they were up here in our part of the world and they live 2000 miles from here. So, um, but they were here in person and my wife and I had talked and it was like, I think this conversation needs to happen. And so mm-hmm. I, I sit down and, uh, had this really, really hard conversation, something that they just did not want to hear. And, and it was one of the most difficult conversations, um, you know, in, in my marital life, um, and with them as in-laws. And, and, uh, I remember my mother-in-law, she was just like, she could, the pain of, of having this conversation was hard. And she's like, yeah, but you're an abuser. Um, and, and like, in the moment I just like, like my, my anger went from zero to, you know, 90, a hundred, you know, it's like, you know, and, and my inside of me is like, I want to punch you in the face. He has that <laughs> feeling. And then, and then, uh, 
in the very next moment, like just a microsecond, I could just sense the spirit of God saying, you need to own this. Mm. And, um, and as I listened to that, I was like, yeah, that's actually true. I do need to own this. Mm. And so, um, and so rather than punching her in the face, like my anger side wanted to do, it was, no, you're right. And it's caused a lot of pain in our family. I'm having to work through this. Uh, so you saw the truth when she said it, you owned it and yeah, and well, she was correct. And there was an interesting thing is like this thing that is behind the scenes that mm-hmm. is, you know, um, hurting people mm-hmm. never got talked about. Never, there was no willingness to interact on it that, hey, this action here, or these words here were abusive and hurtful. They had been left unsaid for years. Mm-hmm. It was just, it's talked about behind the scenes. And it's yeah. like, but in these hard moments, it was just everything got thrown on the table and it's like, let's get it on, you know? Mm -hmm. But the invitation was from anger was to destroy the family. Mm -hmm. And the invitation from the spirit was no, actually this is a great moment of reconciliation. Uh, Yeah. And if you own your side Mm -hmm. of the street, uh, great healing can come from that. And we see this in recovery constantly, right? Because I, I think about guys that have said to me, this is the first time I've ever said this, but I even think about the guys, let's say, who understand that they really are not on top of their alcohol Mm -hmm. issues, that they really do have an alcohol problem. Mm -hmm. And that's like the elephant in the room and they sidestep around it. When they finally say, hey, I am an alcoholic or or, I struggle with this, then real healing comes because they deal with it. Yeah. It's a great, it's a good point. Yeah. And for me, you know, fear, you know, uh, what I was controlling because of fear, I wanted uh, to control my image, what people uh, uh, thought. And so, yeah, I would even try to control what my wife would say about, you know, our finances or things that were happening in our family. I would try to control that. Well, that's, Mm. that's abusive actions. Um, And it was from fear. Mm. And the moment I could uh, release that and say, you know what, I don't actually need to live in that anymore. That was peace. Like even, mm-hmm. even being able to say, yeah, I am an abuser and, uh, and start working through the process of healing and admitting that and finding healing and not needing to control and not needing to work from fear was such a peace and enjoy journey. And it has been through the recovery process and through that journey that, it is not avoiding the elephant in the room anymore. Mm -hmm. And to see my family tiptoeing around uh, avoiding the elephant is not good, but we have to take ownership for our own uh, hard conversations. And, but that's the journey to peace. It's the journey to healing. It could be ignored for many more years, but all it was doing was just creating great harm Yeah, uh, by ignoring the hard conversations. And so I think what we're talking about today is um, taking time to, climb the ladder of integrity i guess what would you say sean in making a decision to to get out of denial and i mean it sounds like your mother-in-law pointed something out to you that you were in denial about is that true or did you she just stated the obvious (laughs) i don't know um there's a level of recognition that there were things that i had done in the past, I hadn't taken ownership for on my side of the street. Mm-hmm. So yes. And so um, being denial means unwilling to admit and go make amends, I guess, in this case. Mm-hmm. It wasn't that I didn't know that I had acted angry, uh, controlling all those things in some sense. But there was a denial that it was impacting everyone around me. I had made excuses. Like with my kids, I call myself a strict disciplinarian. Mm. I put a story wrapper around this that, yeah. Hey, I didn't put up with nonsense in my house. Yeah. Uh, but actually the, there was a lot of that was just control and abuse yeah. out of, uh, putting the wrapper around that because it was about me. Yes. And I think, yeah, because if we deny, we don't have to take ownership over that. Yes, that's right. And it's painful to take ownership over something, yeah. but in the end it's much, that's your pathway to peace. It is your pathway to peace. And yeah. I think for us, yeah, as we're on this journey right now, I think our bodies, as, as you go down this road, your body starts telling, hey, there's conflict that's unresolved. And if you can listen to yourself in that window of time, I wasn't in a position where 
yet where I, where I thought of my body as a major profit as opposed to a minor profit, if that makes sense. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a Scazzaro term. Uh, mm-hmm. Hey, your body's a major profit, not a minor profit. And so when you sense uh, anxiety, unease, and, you know, and for me, it's in my stomach a lot of times or something like that, but others mm-hmm. it might be in their neck or another place that your nervous system um, interacts with. It's going to, what is that? What's causing that? Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a point of, unawareness because you can stuff that so much where you try to uh, stuff all your feelings out where we're at today where i'm at today is yeah i sense it before i know it mm. if that makes sense and then when i sense it it asks it, it, it asks it causes my mind to ask the question what's going on here and why right right, right. and then work through and so that's a tool that you can use but i think it takes mm. First, being willing to feel your emotions, to be able to do that. If you can't feel your emotions, if you're like I was where you were stuffing your emotions, stuffing, 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 you can't feel anything and you don't have recognition. These are uh, signals and triggers and things that are happening that your body's telling has happened beforehand. You're probably doing something. I was doing something to suppress my emotions to not feel them. And and so that's a long-winded way of just saying um, start with being willing to think about what are the unresolved conflicts that are in your life and do you need to go address them? And it could be even, am I in denial about my cancer journey? What am I avoiding about the pain of this journey? And let me look at that. And then what are the, cause we thought relationships, I think relationships are a big part of this journey. And even in the cancer space is to find peace. You really need to, you know, connect with those most close relationships in your life and look through those and take time to say, Hey, what's left unaddressed? What is yeah. uh, conflicts or what's the elephant? I think it's a great yeah, question. I think it's um, like the unwillingness to deal with the elephant uh, in the cancer journey, at least for me, what dawns on me is the unwillingness to, to let fear, anger, and sadness surface because a lot of times the cancer patient doesn't feel safe with immediate family, um, maybe in their church community, whatever it is, um, that that would show weakness or, uh, and, and, but, but it's a paradox because it actually shows strength when, you know what I mean? Like when someone says, Hey, I'm scared, I'm going to die or, you know, I'm, I'm really sad. I don't want to leave my family. Like, even though those show vulnerability, they're a, they're a huge strength, right? It takes courage to show vulnerability is what you're saying. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think this is, it's such a great encouragement to say for, and and encouragement is us giving others courage. We're at, we're helping them to have the courage to step into things that are difficult for them to step into. And so I think that's what we're wanting to do today is encourage you. And, you know, you mentioned the church situations and you and I have beliefs that, are different. I mean, there are going to be faith beliefs that, Hey, um, it's just a faith journey in the sense of a, if I believe enough, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. And, and a belief in faith journey is an important part of the cancer journey, Mm -hmm. but it's more than that is what we believe that there's, um, it's asking you, it's calling you into taking steps into your life to look at your life, to step into the hard areas, the painful stuff. And so feeling anger, sadness, loss Mm -hmm. is not bad. Right. Um, it is, it's a recognition that there is loss. I mean, I, I think the garden of Gethsemane, let's just, it's all through scripture, but let's just take Jesus who they, who the scripture said was in agony and I'm sure the anguish, there's a lot of, you know, adjectives used for it, but he was in a place like he knew that it was all going to work out, Yes, but he still expressed his his agony, his sadness, and Lord, take this cup away from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. I mean, and all through scripture, there's instances like in the Psalms and everywhere else where people are agonizing with like fear, anger, sadness. Um, And these are like unbelievably godly characters out of the scriptures, you know? And if you are avoiding them, yeah, that probably is for everybody else an elephant in the room. Yeah. And I think that's something to, yeah. if you're on a cancer journey and you're unwilling to feel those hard emotions, that's an elephant mm-hmm. uh, that should be 
as if you hear this podcast, it should be something that uh, gives you a little bit of an awakening. Hey, wait a second. Maybe um, I'm not approaching this journey in a way that's yeah. healthy. And I think the, the scriptures, the positive scriptures, the positive words of encouragement are meant to be truths that are breathed in to, to like to me, but it still doesn't negate my need to process fear, anger, and sadness, you know? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's uh, just allowing yourself to feel those. Yeah. And then, and then what you're really uh, doing is the faith step is trusting God that's with it. your fear, anger, yeah. and sadness and not trusting that he's going to do what you want. Right. Trusting right. that he has your best, no matter what uh, happens out of that. And so that's the, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh-huh. you know, I believe that we're going to be saved, but even if it's not, we're going to follow us because we trust in the goodness. And so there's an understanding that God doesn't have to do what I want. Did that just come to you just then? Yeah. Oh, that was pretty good. Cause that's a great example of it. <laughs> yeah. Like, sometimes we even want... if our God doesn't rescue us, we still... yeah, that's yeah. exactly what their words were. Even if he yeah. doesn't rec- rescue us, we're still going to follow him because, yeah. um, they believed in his goodness. Yeah. Um, and that's a step of faith. And it's not a step of faith of get what I want. Right. But it's definitely a step of faith. And I really do trust you, God. And so, you know, as we get close to closing this episode out, I think the thing that I want to highlight the most is um, integrity of um, that ladder of integrity is taking time to just mm. look and what do you sense and feel going on in your life? Um, and are there things that are, you know, relationally that are hanging out that are unaddressed that need great healing. Mm. And let's not avoid the elephant in the room. If you want to find peace, uh, take time to climb that ladder, you know, find out what your value is, uh, find out what it is you'd like to communicate, uh, not from a standpoint of addressing it for revenge or whatever is to actually bring reconciliation. What would that communication look like? And And step into it. And I'll just say this, that, you know, cancer patients usually have some, a period of time in which to do this. Right. Yeah. And I know several of my friends who suddenly passed in their fifties. So this is like really in, in reality, these are exercises we should be doing. Oh man. On an ongoing basis, you know, you just stuck, struck a chord. I uh, was talking to a good friend of your mind this morning. He called me up and said, Hey, um, not going to be at our thing. And I'm going to, um, my close friends, um, wake tonight. Um, wow. he had lung cancer and he'd been doing treatments and, and it progressed so fast. Uh, he went in for the treatment. They're like, we can't treat you. As a matter of fact, uh, you probably have less than a month. And he said two weeks later he passed mm-hmm. and it's like, it came so fast. Mm-hmm. You know, he's sitting there just, uh, stunned and we were both just, you know, talking about just feeling that, wow. Uh, yes, this is so, you know, life is so sudden, so short. So, you know, all these things, the loss there. Yeah. Cause it's like, okay, I'll get around to do yes. this. And it's like, and I don't say that to try to manipulate people. No. I'm just saying, I just, that was a phone call this morning. I just was kind of half in shock. Cause like, yeah, that's just, cause that's kind of how it happened with my mom, you know, is that yeah. uh, with her lung cancer, it was so aggressive yeah. that uh, from the time of that diagnosis till her passing, nothing slowed it down. It was just like, it happens that fast. And um, yeah. And if you don't address those things in this window, you may not have that opportunity, Mm -hmm. but don't take that as a manipulation. Think of that as just, it's an opportunity Mm -hmm. uh, for it's a, it's a call into that. And so, you know, and so I think this not avoiding the elephant in the room is something that I've struggled with for a lot of my adult life. And I still, as I sit here today, I'm thinking about, I think there's some elephants that I'm avoiding right now that mm-hmm. I got to figure out how to address that I don't want to do. <laughs> um, and so, so this is good for me too. I need, gosh, I don't have any elephants. You know? <laughs> yeah. You just don't. must be you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say, uh, I'll tell you some in front of everybody if you like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I got huge ones. <laughs> So well, thanks, Sean. That was great. Yeah, I appreciate you all. Everybody listening. I was going to say y'all like my old Texas thing here. <laughs> y'all listening to us now. <laughs> you, you hear? You hear? <laughs> so, um, but I do have some Texas blood in me, so it's okay. I Oklahoma, can say y'all. Oklahoma, Texas. Oklahoma, Texas, yeah. But thanks for listening. Uh, we're glad you yeah. joined us, and uh, we'll be back for another episode soon. Blessings. Awesome.